Chris, do you want to share your thoughts with us? Your sign says you're going to shout. I welcome you to talk to us oh. if you'd like. Sure. If you something you'd like to share, please go right ahead. By all means. Yeah. Well, I'll say the same thing that I just uh, said to Scott, which is I think that I'd like to see the conversation about what's about to happen in Union Square be discussed in a larger context, and that context is, of course, of course, global inequality, which is reaching epic levels, so many of you are probably familiar with the analysis of Thomas Piketty and capital in the 21st century, <clears throat> and his theory is simple enough, really. You could basically reduce it to the idea that the rich get richer, and for good reason, because capital grows more quickly than wages or uh, <clears throat> other forms of income. And so we're seeing that dynamic play out in Somerville in the sense that all across the country, in fact, uh, very high net worth individuals are moving back into urban cores, and in the process, they're not only displacing the uh, existing residents of the urban cores, they're also capturing uh, amenities which were built with public money and were built in, originally to serve the middle class back when we still had one. <clears throat> and uh, so the real dynamic that we're seeing is a kind of monumental injustice in which uh, very powerful and rich people who actually don't need a break, uh, or really don't need any kind of handout from the government or anything like that are getting one. They're gonna help themselves to enormous benefits which weren't, weren't originally designed for them. And in the process, they're going to achieve a very high uh, quality of life, while the people who used to live here and made this an interesting and fun place to live are going to get herded out to other places which will not have much in the way of public services and will not be uh, very nice places to live. And so, of course, that's ethically wrong and unjust. But even this is a much, uh, this, even this can be resituated in a deeper context, which is the context of the idea that our whole uh, way of life should be devoted to the notion of individual actors maximizing their short-term profit. And of course, <clears throat> that's supposed to be sacred in the United States. That's what might amount to an American religion, the idea that it's laudable and ethical for individuals to maximize their short-term profit, even at the expense of other individuals, or perhaps even at the expense of their own descendants, uh, which of course is real now with climate change and so on. We have the idea that a very rich, powerful people could actually help to make the world uninhabitable for their own descendants. It seems very bizarre and Kafkaesque, and yet it's actually occurring. And so I feel that we really need to focus on this. We need to focus on the idea that the injustice that could be done here in Union Square is part of a much larger injustice. And in that larger injustice, we have the idea that um, people could actually fail to show altruism not only to their fellow humans, not only to non-humans, but they could fail to show altruism for the future. And if that happens, of course, then the future just won't include us. So I feel that's the larger discussion we should focus on. Climate change, it's coming to a planet near you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So we've been discussing that very topic a lot. So one of the strategy elements might be to have a place-based social equality metric that's not just you know, affordable housing and, and transportation costs but a Gini coefficient type of place big. It does not exist to my knowledge. And so why not invent it here? And so it might be a very important thing that you contribute to this national model that you're crafting here. Please, come up. And by the way, on the climate change, I mean, this is why we're here, folks. I really think that, um, I really feel an obligation to respond to George's response to Wig's point, which was that the reason why quadrupling the amount of development in the neighborhood plan is justified by simply decreeing it, as opposed to going back to the group that created Summer Vision, even though Summer Vision is being invoked as the moral authority for what we're doing here, George's answer is this is a longer plan. So I would like to understand where there is even room to create 3,100 new housing units instead of the 850 that were in the plan. I understand that one way to do that is that the neighborhood plan reduces the size of the housing units by 20%. And I would, like to, I would like us all to consider what the implications of that are for our community. What, why and how the current parking and truck, 
traffic and parking infrastructure will even be able to support this. And why, which the neighborhood plan never explains, this is a good thing. I, I, I do believe that the draft of the plan we have out answers, it, it answers those questions. It does, I realize it doesn't answer the question of the, of the strategy versus summer vision, and I, and I see that as something that we needed to be more clear about in the draft. Um, but how it lays out on the land is there with the designs of Union Square, and Boynton Yards, and the D blocks, and everything else. How it addresses the transportation issues is it's, it's covered in, 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 in some of the basic numbers, and we'll have more details as we go, but we feel comfortable that that we can we can address it. I, at, at the end of the day, I guess it's, and, and whether or not you think it's a good idea, I guess it, it depends upon whether or not you believe that the combination of working towards generating, uh, addressing our piece of a regional market on the housing side, working towards addressing our interest in achieving our commercial district goals, and doing so in a way that also generates benefits to be able to cover the cost of existing and new infrastructure costs as well as uh, any of the potential public benefits that we may want out of this process makes sense. Um, and you know, as, as, as we go through this, Carson will be at the next meeting, he can tell you what the fiscal impact is of doing this in different numbers and different circumstances. But I don't want to say, I'm not one to say that fiscal impact alone is the reason why I think we should have a certain number of units in a place or not in a place. But those numbers were derived out of the, the building drawings, which were derived out of the charrettes and derived out of the neighborhood plan process. Um, and if you feel we got it wrong and you feel as if we overstepped from what was in those planning documents or the, those planning meetings, I mean, tell us in the comments and let us look into it and let us see that. I'm, I'm getting some feedback on that and we're, we're looking into how all of that works, but it certainly was, uh, you know, the, the, there was not some intention here to say let's, let's go above and beyond that. Um, I'm also, I'm intrigued by this whole question about the unit sizes because I, 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 I I don't quite understand where we specified unit sizes in, in either document in enough detail to come to that conclusion. I think that we have always talked about a range of housing, a range of housing types, meeting everything from studios to three beds and making this all work. Our zoning overhaul draft that we had last year talked about a 900 square foot average of unit sizes with the idea that you could only drop lower than that if you offered certain additional community benefits. Um, that's what's in the zoning draft. It's not necessarily what's in the Union Square plan, but I mean, I'm, I'm again open to comment and kind of want to want to hear how all of that goes. Um, one of your questions was <coughs> about whether it can handle the traffic, and I would urge you all and 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 parking um, that, and, and this might be something that we can share with everybody here and throughout Somerville to understand the example of Arlington, Virginia. It's the most important urbanizing suburb in the country. And their 10% of their land that is walkable urban has seen a quadrupling of the square footage over the last 25 years. And it, it, it went from a strip mall kind of car dealership kind of place to a high density walkable urban place. Five different subway stops. And the traffic counts in absolute terms went down over the last 25 years in spite of quadrupling the amount of square footage that everybody that was added to Arlington got there by biking, walking, or rail transit. So that's the future that I think you're looking at here. It's, it's something that you've never experienced before. So I'm not saying we you know, have blind faith but it's important to look at a, 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 a model community such as, uh, such as Arlington. And by the way, that, that land, I've mentioned 10% of their land is walkable urban, you know, high density walkable urban. It used to generate 20% of their tax revenues as a county. It's a tiny county. It's, it's, it's the smallest county literally in the country. Um, and today it generates 55% of their tax base. And much of it's coming from residential, apartments and condos. 
And all those people have, have, have moved in their way, going back to your comment. And then they forgot to have kids. They have a school age child generation rate per unit in those condos and apartments, one thirteenth of the single family homes in Arlington. So, and Arlington beats you as far as number of languages they speak in their language, uh, in their public schools. They speak 80 different languages in Arlington. So this is not some white upper middle income concentration. So Arlington has a lot of lessons to teach places like Somerville throughout the country and we'll get those lessons to you. Um, so final questions and then we need to we get the final, so one here and then I'm going to take Ben's and then I know they've got to move on. I just want to add that uh, Kendall Square actually has similar numbers to Arlington on the traffic counts. They've gone down over the last 10 years as development's gone up. Um, and I realize that in some cases we want to build housing that does generate school kids because we've decided as a community we want to do that. But um, I think we, we, can, we can choose our destiny as to how we do that by what types of housing we build and how we mix them. And it's something we're very sensitive to. But we. We, are, we as a community can accept more kids because of the way our situation is set up and we have talked about wanting family housing and I certainly want to hear more from that from people as we go along, but that is part of it. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, my name is Gary Trujillo. I live in Union Square. I'm sorry. Okay. Give you both mics. Okay. Okay. Uh, I live uh, in Union Square just adjacent to the D2 parcel. I'm, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask Professor Leinberger perhaps um, to give us a little more information about one aspect of the study that was mentioned that I, I think you said was done jointly by George Washington University, the Barr Foundation, and... Um, Northeastern and MAPC. Right, that's the one. Okay, so um, you, you, you talked about um, how this expressed um, uh, social values, I think, that, that it, it was an attempt to sort of um, represent th those kinds of um, uh, s subjects. But I'm wondering to what extent the people who were affected were actually invited to participate in that process. And um, I, I'd also like maybe to get a reference. Where can that document uh, be found? Uh, you also talked about um, about we don't have the technology to do certain things, and you talked about metrics, which to me suggests a very a very um, um, well it, it's a way of looking at a problem from a certain kind of perspective, and I think there's a there's a, a, a thread here that uh, is kind of being expressed by a number of people that. I would interpret as maybe suggesting that some things are not easily quantifiable or subject to uh, technological solutions. Um, and the last thing I want to uh, mention is that this, this, this comments period may kind of have the same sort of flavor to it, that, that there's a pre-established kind of uh, process that's based upon a set of assumptions about how this whole thing should proceed. Uh, and um, as, as, as I look around here, uh, I, I would think that there are more people in the city who are interested in this, uh, in, in the subjects that are being talked about here, but they're not really all that well represented. And I know that before this event was, uh, was planned, there was a um, sort of promise made to make sure that it's well publicized. And I'm wondering, maybe someone could say um, something about where it's been publicized. I, I know that it's being recorded, and so I'm hoping also that that recording will be available, I, I guess, on the city website for, for download. Okay. Uh, and uh, I guess that's about all. Uh, thank you. So, starting at the back, the, the publicity of it, yes. Victoria. So information about these meetings has been distributed um, quite a few times. Um, I've been to the CAC meetings in person to speak about what the process is going to look like and give the dates. 
um, including when they have changed uh, based on some feedback that we received. We also work with the city and have put out several packet releases at this point uh, talking about the process, the selection of the strategy leaders, and when these meetings would be held. And those went all out to all of the, um, the publications in Somerville, as well as to the CAC listserv um, to try to reach as many people as uh, I'll just jump in on that as well. The, the, these meetings have also all been publicized at recent ResiStat meetings, and ResiStat are the local neighborhood meetings of each ward that happen each spring and each fall, and those are very, very well attended by the community, so we wanted to make sure to publicize that, them that way. Um, our communications department has also been working with all of the major news outlets and so forth to try to get the message out there. We've been publicizing through various social media channels, our language liaisons have been going out into the immigrant community and sharing with their networks as well. So um, this is actually one of the largest and most extensive public outreach processes that we've probably ever had here in Somerville and um, we continue to be committed to making this an inclusive process and that is one of the reasons why we fully intend to, again we're live streaming of course, but then we also fully intend to have an, a number of meetings in between both the first locus session tonight and the, the session, the sessions that occur in January which include both community meetings um, that are, will be held by the CAC and the city and, and meetings that will be held in various languages um, through the Summer Viva liaisons and there um, some interpreters coming in for that as well. So, uh, and then again, just to reiterate, we each strategy leader who is here today is fully expected to go back in the meantime between the sessions and do additional outreach to the stakeholder groups that we that have been represented. And, you, and Gary, I do believe that you were here throughout the day and, and heard many of the groups who are represented here at this table today, including um, probably most heavily the immigrant community and the low income community. And so we will make sure that that continues to happen and we will do outreach to other groups if you feel that any of those are underrepresented. Right. And, and so just to uh, position this day for those of you that were not here starting at one o'clock. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> you think it's long so far. Um, that th this is an informational day. This is an educational day. And it's the 13th and 14th of January where hopefully the 30 strategy leaders will be reporting back with the strategies that they want to see Union Square follow. And their responsibility between now and January, and actually really December 30th, because we need to get some, some information beforehand, is December 30th, is to uh, reach out to all the different groups that they represent, the immigrant groups, the business groups, whatever to make sure that, that, that they're getting, that, that they're touching every group that they represent to get them into the strategy. And so this is informational. January 13th and 14th is where we hopefully will be coming to consensus about where and how Union Square is going to grow and how it's going to get there. Now, the other question was about the technology and about how we measure this stuff. And I'm gonna be giving a presentation in just a couple minutes about the research that we've done in Boston that the Barr Foundation funded. Looking, and this was at GW, you know, George Washington University, Northeastern University, and MAPC. And it was measuring place-based economic metrics of walkable urban places and how do they perform economically and how do those same places perform from a social equity point of view. And as I mentioned earlier this afternoon, to my knowledge, nobody's ever bothered to measure social equity. So I'm not going to tell you that what we've been developing over the years is the finest social equity measure ever. <laughs> it just happens to be the only one. Um, and if you know uh, Stephanie Pollack, Stephanie was at Northeastern before she stupidly became Secretary of Transportation three days before it started snowing last year. Um, and Stephanie is a social equity specialist. And I think well regarded nationally. I hope you regard her well here in the Commonwealth because she's a, she's a treasure. 
and you couldn't have a better Secretary of Treasury or of uh, Transportation. So <clears throat> she was the one that was the real intellectual spark plug behind the social equity metric. And um, so I, I can't say that we've gone out and surveyed um, everybody who needs affordable housing, but certainly I was working with an academic who's made her life career about that. Uh, and we'll go over the other parts of the study in just one second. So we have a, a few more questions over here. Renee? Is there a goal for how much we want to increase the population of the city? There, there is not a specific goal. We, we, we worked on a housing metric and on a jobs metric. Um, we focused on those as the two numbers we focused on. I mean, you can do some analysis of what 6,000 housing units um, by 2030 would do to the city of Somerville's population. It would still be well below what it was in the 1950s and 1960s, albeit in a somewhat different um, sort of layout um, than what you what what we've had before. But what Summer Vision talks about is that the the areas that refers to as the transformational areas, Union Square, Brick Bottom, Boynton Yards, and Assembly Square, um, um, have significant opportunities to become new neighbor. Well, Union Square already is a neighborhood, but but Boynton Yards and, and or Interbelt, those places have the ability to to bring new housing and new jobs and new opportunities um, and, 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 and kind of build neighborhood centers in a way that works. But, um, you know, someone's asked me before what the number is that, the, that, that would be created if you hit 66,000 6, new units. It's, it's somewhere in the high 80,000s probably, but it's still well below the 100,000 plus that we've had as a population in the past. And I would just urge you, as Chris mentioned earlier, um, you know, speaking for your kids and grandkids and for Mother Earth, that high density, walkable, urban development and living is the number one thing we can do as a society to address climate change. Number one, that the built environment generates almost 75% of greenhouse gas emissions. Buildings generate about 40, transportation system in this country about 30. And you move somebody from a drivable suburban fringe out in Concord or beyond 128, beyond 495, and you bring them into Somerville, you drop their greenhouse gas emissions by between 50 and 80 percent. That makes it the number one way we can address climate change. So I would urge you, for the sake of my grandkids, to repopulate Somerville. All right, so we're on, I know Ben had his. I'm sorry. What did you? you, know, you, you, you why don't you give us your observation? I want to make sure that Ben and Benny get their questions afterwards, and then I think we should probably move on to the next step of what you've got to do. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. My observation, you know, now that we want to bring people here to the city of Somerville, is that we want to create housing that's sustainable um, and sustainable in a financial way. Somebody mentioned Kendall Square earlier that the traffic went down. What also spiked right up was their commercial tax revenue that they were giving Cambridge. So when I look at Union Square, I'd really like to have a housing number that the city can handle police-wise, fire-wise, trash-wise, recycling-wise. Those, those services, those constituent, you know, for my Fellow aldermen, when I, you know, when I served, those were the phone calls that we got with the constituent services right down to the ground level of the sidewalk in front of someone's house. And I just don't want us to put in a position where we're paying a ton of money to have a lot of people in this city. And we, we lost an opportunity to really grow our commercial tax base, which impacts jobs and which impacts the opportunity for local businesses. Thank you. So real quick on that comment, I want you, when you get a chance, to look at the fiscal impact report and look at what it says is the increase in police and fire and having been a former alderman, give a thought to that and see if that seems reasonable to cover those costs and still allow the other benefits because that is definitely something that is, is part of what we need to measure. I mean, one of the reasons why we've looked at commercial and residential together is because there, there, there just isn't an interest anymore in creating all commercial office parks. The ones in the suburbs are struggling. Building one in the city is difficult. Building a mixed-use neighborhood is better. But you're right, we have to get all that balance right. So appreciate it. 
Um, ben. So um, first, thanks. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed that this plan, the neighborhood plan is missing is, I noticed it talks about children friendly, it talks about senior friendly um, area, uh, friendly city, but I don't see immigrants and even low income necessarily uh, outlined in specific policies and in other things. And, you know, speaking of, I was with Summer Vision and I know diversity was the number one thing that everyone talked about. So, you know, it's the biggest little thing when you look at the map and all that. So I just feel like we're missing something here. Well, t I, my, I urge you over the course of, of the next few days, take a look through the whole plan document, particularly look at the affordable affordability stuff on housing and, and commercial. If we didn't, uh, and, and, and to the extent that you're making the point that we may not have directly addressed the diversity issue head on, especially the ethnic diversity in the neighborhood and maintaining it, if you see a gap there, be sure to send us a message that says that because that's a very, it's a very good point to make and we want to make sure those are the sort of things we're hearing and can address. Um, Benny? Okay. So I have several thoughts <coughs> coming into my brain right now. Um, so there's a little thought traffic jam happening. Um, I, I feel like Chris really voiced something that is so important right now, which is that, uh, you know, I think the typical, the typical mindset here is, and, and, and people have said this already earlier today, you can't ask too much of the developer. You can't ask them to give up too much of their profits. And there's this totally different mindset. I feel like I'm coming from this totally different place that's, um, you know, in order to make the world the place it's supposed to be, you have to, you have to sacrifice something. You can't just make billions of dollars. Uh, so if we are real about wanting to protect the people who are the most vulnerable, about wanting to empower the people who have the least power in our society, you can't do that and allow everybody to make every billion dollar that they want to make. Like, it involves sacrifice on everybody's part. I mean. For example, talking about climate change, stop riding airplanes. But nobody, nobody's going to stop riding airplanes, right? Because we have this lifestyle that we want to maintain. So there are these tensions where it's like, well, I want everything to be good and right, but I don't want to give up the stuff that I have. And I think that that's like so huge in the room right now. And you know, I don't know what to do about that. That's like a huge societal problem. But I think that we can't just pretend it's not happening. We can't just pretend like that. The, you know that that issue is not the center of what's happening right now. We're trying to like go around the outskirts of like, well, we can't give up our billions of dollars. So what are we gonna do to try to help the poor people? Anyway, so there's that. Um, <laughs> uh, the other thing um, in terms of the the. Um, you know, the outreach and publicity for this event, I feel really excited that so much outreach was done. I also think, though, at the same time, that this is an inherently exclusive format, right? People had to apply, people were chosen, were picked um, in order to have the actual power and control in this situation. And everybody who wasn't chosen, who wasn't picked, you know, can give their public comment, but, um, you know, but there's, there's a, there, it lends a certain feel to a process when certain people are allowed to be like in the inner sanctum and certain people are not. Um, certain people are given this like microphone where I can spout off as much as I want and other people, you know, have less of an opportunity for that. So I, I think the publicity is great. I'm glad I'm entertaining you, Ben. Um, I think the publicity is great, but I also think that there's like, there are these sort of fundamental mindsets and assumptions that we are going on here, which are, Kind of at odds with some of the with some of the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, and uh, you know that's difficult to manage. Chris, what's going on? I'd like to address your point, if I may. Really? I promise. <laughs> it's a really important. I'm holding Chris behind schedule. I really appreciate that, George. Thank you. I'd like to address your point. I'd like to fill in some specifics. So, um, what you're worried about is something that other people have called growthism, and it's actually specifically addressed in the UN Charter. Uh, so the UN Charter, unbeknownst to most people, actually commits human beings to keeping Earth habitable, at least for themselves, and of course that means for most non-humans, indefinitely, no time limit. 
So as far as you know, your question about what's the maximum population and so on, all of this needs to be revisited in that context. And the context basically comes down to um, the idea that as, the resu as a result of the perhaps unexpected constraints that climate change and other environmental factors are placing on us as a species, right? we're going to have to make do with less. We're going to have to make more with less. And so this is, by the way, stands in direct opposition to the whole idea of people maximizing their self-interest and that everybody who can climb to the scramble to the top of the financial pyramid can, not only can and should do so, but it's somehow laudable and we should all stand around and clap and say how great that is. And by the way, that relates very much to what happened at Lake Shore East. And I just would, I don't want to pass up this opportunity to mention that. So, uh, you know, most people might not have actually done the research, but I did. I did the research and found out what US2 or Magellan's great claim to fame is, and you know, Lake Charisse is the project they're known the best for. And what that was was a public amenity, by the way. That was a you know, municipal golf course. Uh, by all accounts, it was very nice, and people either liked it, uh, and it was turned into a rapid warrant of luxury condos and multi-million dollar townhouses. And so you can say that that was necessary and that uh, that was smart growth, and that that was all very important to uh, concentrate people in the urban core and so on. There's all, in many ways you could drape that in green fabric and make it more palatable. I'm sure people sat through a lot of meetings, much like the ones that I've sat through in these last months, where that was all done. But the bottom line is that a public amenity, which had originally been built for the middle class and had its merits, was turned over to a very wealthy section of the population. And so that's, I think, the model that I'm frightened of here. I don't think that all of the uh, motivations here are necessarily altruistic. I, I, I just, I, I, I want to, I, 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 I'm going to, I've got to let Chris move on, so I'm, I'm going to do my best to try to do that. Um, I do certainly want to address that I do believe that US2 and any other entity that comes into the world of Union Square is well aware that um, to work with us in Somerville and do what we're going to do, we want to set the ground rules for them as a community and have them all work to meet those ground rules. And that's why we're doing a neighborhood plan. That's why we're doing zoning work. That's why we're doing public benefits conversations. And, and I think we all understand that, that, that it's, it's best for us to work at a level of looking at this as a neighborhood and understanding where we want to go and work towards doing that. Um, I have, oh, let's see. So before I go any further, I just, um, Alderman Houston from War Two has arrived in Alderman Dennis Sullivan, I saw, and I don't know if he's hiding back there, but he was over there, and Alderman Niedergang from Ward 5 is here. Um, before we move on, if any of the elected officials in the room had something they wanted to say, I wanted to give them a chance, and then I wanted to move on to the next step here and say thank you all for a spirited discussion. I really appreciate it, and I, I, I would have taken this all to heart. It's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thanks, George. I'm Mark Niedergang, the Ward 5 Alderman. I hate to follow Chris because he's much more entertaining than I am, but I'll try to be brief. Um, I was watching on TV and you all look good, very impressive, it's a great discussion. Uh, the thing that really popped out to me is when uh, Mr. Leinberger talked about the seventh inning. I've been playing baseball my whole life, so I know what that means. My concern is if the residential stuff gets built first, which is what most developers want to do because it's a sure thing, it's very profitable, uh, it's a clear way to, to get something done and make money that the ninth inning will come and the game will be over and the cycle will, will bust and the commercial won't get built. And I think we're all united in understanding that we need commercial development for jobs and, and the tax base. So that's a concern that I have. Uh, the second uh, issue that I think we really have to go into a lot more depth on is the whole family housing issue. Uh, I've looked at the numbers for the uh, 3,100 units in Union Square. And it is hard to imagine how there's going to be big enough units to house families and how we're gonna do that. And I happen to believe that's an important value that this community holds, that we wanna have more kids in our schools, not fewer. And that has to be factored into the costs. Uh, and we have to figure out how to, how to build enough big apartments for these families to live in. I grew up in New York City on the 10th story of a big apartment building with my brother and sister. So I know that families can live in apartments. Uh, it may be a change of, uh, of thinking, but that seems to be happening among younger people these days. So we need to figure that one out before the residential stuff starts going up. Uh, and finally, I want to say, I really think it's important that there be some additional time for the public comment period, at least till the end of the year. Thank you.
this goes to the Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Mary Ann Houston, more two aldermen. I'll talk about why I just walked in in a moment. But um, to, um, to echo what my uh, colleague has just said, I've always felt that um, if, and you know, Steve Mackey knows this going way back in the Chamber of Commerce, if this city doesn't concentrate on commercial development, you know, we, we cannot do anything for the good citizens of this city, and we won't be able to do anything for families, for young professionals, for anyone. Um, that's the key, that's the linchpin. I'm not gonna elaborate on it, but that's where my focus is right now. If you don't get the commercial development in, um, we will just have vast wastelands of housing, and, and housing can't be a vast wasteland without that commercial development. The second thing I wanna say about families is this. When I first became an alderman 15 years ago, there were a bunch of young professionals, some who had no children at all, some who were not couples or anything else. And over the course of the last 15 years, I continue to see those same faces. And it's been really gratifying to me to see those families stay here. And everyone said, oh, they'll leave when their kids get into, you know, when they get out of preschool, because we have free preschool. So everyone will stay here for preschool and then they'll go. But guess what? They haven't gone. So what we need to do is we need to set the stage to encourage families to stay here. And families are staying here despite the fact that, you know, there may not be sufficient housing for a growing family. So I also want to say that as well. That this is what I have experienced. And it's important to me as an alderman because I don't want to see the next voting cycle with 300 people voting in the ward. You know, and the only way that you get that kind of commitment, the civic commitment, is to encourage families, is to encourage generations, which is where I come from. Having lived my entire life in the city, it was always generational. It was not just, you know, the family, it was the extended family um, that you could point to and say, they've been here. That's the second thing. The third thing I want to say is this, and I apologize to, um, you know, people who have put this together, but the reason I just walked in is because since I have been 15 years old, I have worked every single day of my life. I have gone to school, I've gotten a master's degree, but I have worked even when I went to school, and that's what I was doing today. I was working my day job, and so to have meetings that begin at one o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday, is not helpful to a working class girl, which is what I still am. And I just needed to say that and have people understand why I just walked in. Thank you. So, any final comments before we move to the next part of this process? Wig, go ahead. Yeah, this is just informational. Um, when the plan came out, I asked if there could be a high resolution ground plane plan with dimensions on it so we could, you know, calculate how big building footprints were or, or, or calculate open space. I haven't got a response on that, but I think it's pretty important to have at least one high resolution um, dimensioned plan, and the axonometrics are, are nice to look at, but they're scaleless for a lot of people. I, 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 first of all, I will assure you, they're all very high dimension. That's the reason why the file's so big. All I've got to do is put the, I mean, high resolution. So if you zoom in, you can see a lot of detail on those documents. I'll try to take one that's a ground plane and basically dimension the buildings and the lots, if that's what you're looking for. It's a relatively Even scale. just a great scale with an accurate line diagram? I mean, whatever you can do, George. See what I can, I'll see what I can turn around quickly and do. Okay, sure. So a couple answers to some of the questions that were just recently raised. Um, as far as the seventh inning and the fact that real estate is a roller coaster ride, it makes the car business look like a cakewalk as far as the severity of the cycle. That's just the way it's been for 6,000 years. It ain't changing anytime soon. The issue is whose money's at risk? And the bulk of the money will be the private money at risk. So just recognize that if whoever the developer is is proposing to do something, they sink first. That, that, that the studies show um, in downtown Chattanooga, 
as it, um, as it turned around. For every $1 of public money in Chattanooga, it was $13 of private money. So that's, it's somewhere between 10 and $15 of private money. So just recognize who's got more skin in the game, and it's the private sector. So if they go down, they go bankrupt, and they've made a bad call. The building's not going away. It's still paying property taxes. And it may be owned by a bank. It's not a good thing, but it doesn't wipe out the city. Um, second thing is talking about families, and I'm not saying this applies to Somerville, but I want to give you national numbers that you gray hairs out there like me, when we were growing up, 50% of households had children living in the household. 50% were singles and couples. That's the 50s and 60s. That's the leave it to beaver imagery. Um, in the, you know, today, it's 25% of households have children living in them. It's dropped in half. The marginal increase in household formation over the next 20 years, the marginal growth, not looking at, at what we have today, but what, what we're gonna to add to it. The marginal growth in household formation, only 14% of households will have children living in them. 86% will be singles and couples. So just factor that into your thinking. I'm not saying that it applies to Somerville, but that's the national. Yes, Stephanie. I just want to say uh, on that point, um, Somerville has the second lowest percent children in the Commonwealth and of any um, community that's 20,000 or more in population, and the one that's lower than us is Cambridge. So if we do add to the, the population of 25 to 40 year olds, we will most likely become the, the lowest, the smallest percentage of children. And it certainly that seems to me like you have this if you have the um, people like Amanda who want to, it's like a, a road where you have like six lanes that go down to two, and so only a small percentage of those current millennials will be able to stay. But just recognize, you know, somebody, I guess Chris mentioned that we have to do with less. Well, the, you know, the great news about where we are today in 2015 is that the number of young people worldwide, those under 15, have peaked and the population is now going down for young people. That's good news for the population of the planet. And that, yes, we're still going to get to 10 billion people, 11 billion people on the planet, but we've already turned the corner uh, as those young people get older. So it's just a different dynamic that your grandkids, our, our great grandkids are going to be dealing with populations that are falling worldwide. And that's a good thing because the planet can. So. But why would Somerville have to be so much lower than every other community in the Commonwealth? I think we have the highest percentage of, of some 25 to 40 year olds in the, in the country or something like that. Second. It's just it, second highest. So it just, it's really imbalanced, basically. I think, I think it, I'm guessing it goes back to your high education level. High education levels are leading the way towards lower number of children. So get out there and have kids. Um, <laughs> The other thing which I now want to move towards, we wanted to talk this evening, again, this is educational. So for the strategy leaders to understand that in essence, what we heard from George and the fiscal impact study is that the redevelopment of Boynton Yards and, and, and uh, Union Square, but in particular Boynton Yards, Boynton Yards is, is generating 80% of your net fiscal impact. So to a certain extent, Boynton Yards is your cash cow. Union Square is still positive, but it's, it's not generating the kind of net fiscal impact that Boynton Yards is. So that, that redevelopment is both paying for the infrastructure improvements that you desperately need. Our, my generation has done a miserable job in investing in our public infrastructure. We're investing one-third of what we should have. We're living off of our parents' infrastructure. It's shameful. Well, this process is going to start turning that around, at least in Union Square and Boynton Yards. And it also, thank goodness, is, 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 is teeing up 
a significant positive benefit for the social or for the community benefits that we're here discussing and we'll be discussing over the next two months. That's all very good news. I'm pleasantly surprised, but I am surprised. I, I was really fearful that we would only have enough fiscal benefit to pay for the infrastructure and we'd be here like cats in a bag, fighting over scraps. I want to share with you something that um, GW, Northeastern, and MAPC did, funded by BAR, that we've been talking about. This is the Walk Up, Wake Up Call. Walk Up is a shorthand for walkable urban places. Walkable urban places shorten naturally to WUP, which is whoops, which is not exactly a great acronym. <laughs> So we came up with Walk-Up. And it looked at the entire metropolitan region of Metro Boston. Nobody has ever looked at the entire metro area as far as the built environment. Before we get there, it's important to have one basic understood, which is that not all jobs are equal. You all know that, but here's why. There are three broad categories of jobs. There are export jobs that make goods and services and ship those goods and services out of the region and fresh cash comes into the region. They are the reason your metropolitan area exists. Your number one export earner is higher education. Even though it, you know, the service is, is, is delivered here, but parents from throughout the world are sending checks to Tufts Harvard, MIT, and BU, and that money stays here. This is how you make your wealth. That's one of the export jobs. Medical care, you're a, you're a medical provider to the world, not just to the region. That's one of your export earners. Finance is, and, you know, and biotech. Those export jobs are why everybody is in this room. Without those export jobs, you'll be in some other town because you won't be able to make a living here. Those export jobs pay the most. And they ripple through the economy. And for every one export job, you create at least two other jobs. And those are in the categories of regionally significant jobs or local serving jobs. Regional jobs are like uh, bankers, lawyers. They're like real estate developers and, and, and the construction. These are jobs that locate in one place but serve the entire region. Local serving jobs are policemen, grocery clerks, school teachers. These are jobs that are necessary for where people live and in, for bedroom communities. They tend to be the lowest paying jobs. Regionally significant jobs pay the second highest. Export jobs pay the most. So when you're going to be coming up with a strategy for here, the question is, you know, the office, the commercial jobs that you're talking about, you're probably going to be pulling in export jobs. Maybe some regional jobs. So just keep that in the back of your mind because it's, it's, it's what's fueling all of this growth. Boynton Yards is fueling 80% of the fiscal impact. So recognize what those jobs are. So there are two ways to build the built environment. One way is walkable urban. That's what you've been doing for 200 years. This has been a walkable urban community since it was founded. The other way, and by the way, walkable urban means that it's mixed use, ideally mixed income, and lots of different uses all within walking distance. You can get there by many different transportation modes, but once you're there, it's walkable. And maybe if you live there, you don't need a car, and you just walk to go to everything that you need. I live in a walkable urban place in DuPont, down in DC. Unfortunately, I did fly here. I understand, that's, that's, that's my, that's my uh, cross to bear. And that um, 
we don't use our car, but you know, my wife and I have one car, and it's eight years old, and it just pushed over 25,000 miles. It just sits there almost all the time, because there's just no reason to use it. That's what Somerville, for a lot of you, is. And drivable suburban, you understand as well, <coughs> much lower density, 1 40th to 1 5th the density of walkable urban. Every product type, housing, retail, office, are scattered all over the place, and the only way, way to get between them is by car and truck, otherwise known as sprawl. That's how we've been growing in the late 20th century. That's what the market wanted. That's why Somerville suffered. When I lived in Arlington, when I did my requisite two years in graduate school here, um, why Somerville was sort of off the radar. I did come here for Steve's ice cream, however. So. And so two ways of building the environment. Walkable urban, drivable suburb. Two ways of, of economically using land. One is local serving. Bedroom community where 90% of the square footage is residential, 10% support commercial. Most of you probably live in local serving places. The other way is regionally significant, where those export jobs and regionally significant jobs locate, where the wealth is created, where civic functions locate. We're in a regionally significant place right here. And Union Square, as the plan lays out, is a, is a regionally significant plan. So, two ways of using land economically, two ways of, of the land being formed, the land use patterns. You get a simple four cell matrix. So for the first time ever in any metropolitan area, we looked at Boston, the 3,100 square miles that is metropolitan Boston. Nobody's ever done this before. And we dropped those 3,100 square miles into those four cells. The walkable urban land, either regionally significant or local serving, totals 5.6% of your region. That's it. And it's where 40% of you live and 42% of the jobs are. Our hypothesis is that now that the market wants walkable urban, that 5.6 might go to 8%, maybe 10, not above 10, 80% of future development over the next generation is going to go to that less than 10% of the land. Right now it's 5.6. That includes Union Square. That's where the market wants to go. And the question is making yourself attractive to bring that office lab space, retail, and other uh, tax-paying uses into Union Square. Please, Anne. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. And, and, and that is why I would, I would you know, bet anything in the future that your traffic congestion, even as you grow, is going to stay the same or go down. And that's counterintuitive. And uh, you, know, you better rethink your parking codes as well, because you're going to, have much, you're going to need much less parking, because more people are going to get there by rail, bike, Particularly bike. Bike is really important. We can get going, well, except when it snows up here like you had last winter. But, um, you know, Copenhagen has 45% of their transportation is on bike. All it takes is a paintbrush and you have a bike lane. And you can add, you know, use, you know increase your capacity by a huge percentage. It's huge. It's just. And it snows all the time there, and it's dark, and it's cold. <laughs> Nine-month winters. <laughs> um, so you're in a very good position right now. 
what was 20 years ago a negative from a market point of view is today a positive. The market, you know, the wind's at your back. Now, this just might interest you if you're a policy nut. Um, there's 5.5 billion square feet in metropolitan Boston. Nobody's ever done a census of how much real estate there is. That's all the for sale housing, that's the rental apartments, that's the retail, that's the industrial. 68% um, of it is residential, of the square footage. That's probably the same throughout the entire country. Uh, and, and by the way, we'll put this on a website so you can have all these slides. And we'll give you a link to the, um, to the report. But 5% um, of the five percentage points are the rental apartment complexes. Keep in mind that about 12 to 14 per percentage points of the for sale housing is actually rented. You do a lot of that here because of, of the students. And I'm guessing, and this needs to be researched more, that a lot of the students are driving families out. That there's a lot of single family homes and townhouses that are, or, or triple deckers, that could be family housing that are occupied by students. And students would rather be in student focused apartments, but you don't offer that. So th there's a product mismatch, I'm guessing, in this town. Uh, as a lot of for sale housing is actually rented out. But the other interesting thing is looking at, you know, hotel for instance, 1%, that's it for hotel. And you effectively don't have any hotels in this town. Uh, industrial is 5% and continues to fall. Um, the big black hole, by the way, is that gray, which is civic and institutional, which includes universities. That is not, I mean, I don't want to tell you that that's as, comp, you know, it is not 100%. That's known as owner user space, where the owner of the real estate occupies it. There is no secondary data set for that. You gotta go out and find that. We had to call Harvard, because there's no place to find out how much square footage Harvard has and what category it falls in. Um, same with most government offices. It's just not counted by anybody. So, no, improved buildings. These are all the buildings that are in the region. Nobody's ever bothered to count them all. Yes, David. 14% of the residential property is rented out. Yes. Is that 14% of 63? No, it's 14 percentage points. So, so roughly 52 percent something in that range is actually for sale housing that's occupied by the owner. Right, yeah. It is that somebody's living in that for sale housing. So if you have a for sale house, it, house and you live in it, that's in that 63 percent reduced by the 12 to 14. It, no, no, it's not, no, 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 it's not for sale, no. This, what we looked at most importantly were the, that upper left-hand corner, the regionally significant walkable urban places, the walk-ups. This is the future of your wealth creation, and this is what Union Square could be, if you do it right. And the yellows and the greens and the purples are the 57 walk-ups in the region and 14 emerging. Union Square is one of the 14 emerging. There's certain minimum square footage you have to achieve to be an established walk-up according to our methodology and you're not there yet. You don't have enough square footage. It's 1.4 million square feet of office and 340,000 square feet of retail. You don't have that yet. You will, according to Georgia's plan, or the community plan. And they take the form of, there are seven different types. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but downtown, you know, financial districts one, downtown adjacent places around the downtown, 
are a really popular one. I live in DuPont, that's a downtown adjacent place in DC. Then urban commercial, um, which are places that were, that were pretty much slums 25 years ago. They've come back as high density, regionally significant urban commercial spaces. A lot of South Boston is going through that. Urban universities, urban universities make a great anchor. And you've, of course, had no shortage of them since you're the number one university metro in the country. And around Harvard Yard is obviously famous. Kendall is obviously has, has exploded, but even Northeastern's beginning to become a much more dynamic place. BU, of course, is. So you've got a lot of those. Now, the interesting thing is going out to the suburbs. The urbanization of the suburbs is the most exciting trend out there. And that's what you're dealing with here in Somerville. And you start with what we call elsewhere, suburban town centers, what MAPC calls regional urban centers. So we use that terminology, since that's what you use locally. Your Union Square is technically a regional urban center. And they have been very successful throughout the country because you have a great grid of streets. Well, grid goes too far, I guess, with Union Square. You, you um, hired the drunk donkey to sort of lay, lay it out a few hundred years ago. You have one example of something that's going to be a really big deal throughout the country, but you only have one example of it, which is Brownfield, Greenfield redevelopment, and that's Assembly Road. First time you've seen that in Metro Boston. You see that a lot in other places. The other thing that you have, you have no examples of is um, the conversion of regional malls and business parks into regionally significant walkable urban places. You have zero examples of that. DC has, oh, you know, eight, nine examples, including the biggest one in the country, Tyson's, which is the biggest 48 million square feet of unmitigated traffic hell. Just put in four new metro stations, one third paid for by the real estate developers voluntarily, and it's now booming with residential coming out of the ground. Uh, they just opened 18 months ago as far as the, the station. So this is where it's going. Somerville is one of those locations. 74% of the, of the uh, 57 established walk-ups are rail transit served. It's not a coincidence that they're rail transit served. Each one of these places has a different fingerprint, has a different product mix. So don't expect them all to be the same. In the upper left-hand corner is your downtown walk-ups. And you can see office dominates 70 77% of the square footage. The big play downtown is gonna be residential. With regional urban centers, such as Union Square, that it's right now, on average, you only have 14% office in the regional urban centers like, urban, like Somerville, like Union Square. Um, so the big opportunity there is office. You have an over-representation of retail in most of these places. Uh, you don't, but most of the places they do. And you can see that most of these regional urban centers have, have a fair amount of residential, 40%. So each one of these places have a different product mix, so don't expect them all to be the same. That, as best as I can tell, is they, they, they tend to be the, the uh, either the universities, hospitals, or they're the county seat or some government center. Um, part of my hesitancy is that, that we've only gone this depth in Metro Boston. DC, we're about to redo it. We did it first four years ago. It was a much more tentative methodology. We need more examples to really, as an academic, you can't, you know, much as you want to say you know why things happen, we don't know yet. Um, this is key to what we're talking about, and this is why these fiscal impact numbers were so important 
In Boston, we found that the walkable urban places that are regionally significant on a per acre basis generate 12 times the tax revenue of regional malls and business parks. In fact, your business parks in this region, many of them are toast. That some of them are going to be converted to other uses, much lower quality uses and much lower value uses, and some of them are going to be bulldozed. Um, I was told by your Secretary of Commerce about a year ago, I was on a panel with him, that the business parks out on 128 have to pay a $25,000 per year bonus to get software engineers to drive out from Somerville and Cambridge and Boston to go all the way out to 128 to work there. That 25,000 comes out of the value of the real estate. So, um, and regionally significant, or um, walkable urban neighborhoods that are, um, generate six times the tax revenue per acre as classic subdivisions out on the fringe. So one would have to question why any public sector uh, official allocating scarce capital dollars would ever invest in a drivable suburban business parky regional mall strip mall kind of infrastructure. We talked about social equity and that we measure these places based upon economics and on social equity. The social equity includes the transportation accessibility, particularly by transit. It includes access to opportunity, and it includes housing affordability. And these are the 57 places aligned on this scatter chart. chart. And, um, and accessibility opportunities on the left hand, on the vertical axis, affordability is on the, on the bottom axis. And you see that they scatter in a northwest to southeast fashion. What that, we've seen this elsewhere, that it falls into two broad categories. That you have places that have high opportunity and low affordability. And you have places that have high affordability and low opportunity. This is the segregation of our society that we've been, we've been building consciously for 60 years. As we segregate by race, as we segregate by income. And the goal, it's been around 60 years, and the goal is to get into the upper right hand corner where you have both opportunity and affordability. I think it's possible, and there's a couple of those places that are sort of creeping up there. What I think it takes, and what I would challenge the strategy leaders, I mean, we know how to make a place great economically. We don't know how to make it great from a social equity point of view. I think it takes a conscious strategy on the part of the place management organization, whatever you set up, to get into the upper right hand corner. It's, it's not going to happen naturally. You've got to consciously do it. That's all taxes generated off of real estate. All property taxes and, and so, yes. It is commercial taxes. And that's why the 12 times is so, is so much bigger. Because commercial taxpayers pay more per square foot than residential, generally speaking. Here's something that I found very surprising that I don't understand. And it's counterintuitive. There's a web portal at HUD looking at everybody's, at, at, the, at the census tract level, what percentage of household income is spent on housing and transportation? We've come to realize that you have to count both. You can't just look at the housing cost. You've got to look at housing and transportation because we're spending, you know, drivable suburban households are spending 25% of their household income on a fleet of cars. One car dropped out of your household income, if it's a you know, moderately new car, you drop it out of your household income, you can increase your mortgage capacity by $150,000. One car. 
It costs you $9,200 per year after tax to own and operate a car in this country, according to AAA. And that translates into $150,000 increased mortgage capacity. Cars always depreciate, houses tend to appreciate. It's a great way of building net worth. So one of the big changes that we expect over the next 25 years is Americans are going to spend less on transportation, which pollutes less, and shift that spending into housing, education, and maybe, heaven forbid, we might save something. Um, the numbers in Boston, again, 40, over 40% 40 of you live in walkable urban places, 60% live in drivable suburban. When you look at the housing transportation percentage, drivable suburban places or households are spending on average 48% of their household income on transportation and housing. Walkable urban are spending 43%. We know that the houses cost a whole lot more in walkable urban places because of the pent-up demand for great walkable urbanism now. Obviously, it's being offset by the amount people are spending on transportation. That's a good thing. Um, we need to get into this more because it's, it's, to a certain extent, it's too good to be true. So we have to study that more. So the issue is, is that these walkable urban places have great accessibility, they have low transportation costs, they have high opportunity, but they have high housing costs. That's what the research shows, no surprise there. And so that's why the challenge to you 30 is what's your conscious affordable housing strategy? Wait. Just to point out that Somerville has the most renters. Somerville has the most renters per square mile, and they're not necessarily accumulating wealth when the property appreciates. They are not accumulating wealth as the property appreciates. Here's another thing that I think is important to note. You know, why is this important besides all the social, social uh, uh, kinds of issues that we're talking about? It goes back to the wealth of your region. One of the things that we have found out, we've studied the 30 largest metros and ranked them based upon their walkable urbanism. You and Washington happen to be number one and number two. New York's number three. When the, by the way, when the research came out, the first phone call I got was from the, from the New York Post bitching at me, saying, what do you mean we're number three? Boston and, and D.C. are in front of us. The answer was, Manhattan is the most walkable urban place in the country. No question. It's 0.3 of 1% of the land, 8% of the population live like Jerry Seinfeld, and 92% of it live like Tony Soprano in a McMansion that Metro New York is more sprawled out than Los Angeles. And um, so they, they do well because of Manhattan, but the rest of the place is a mess. So of the th six most walkable metros, Boston, New York, DC, Chicago, Seattle, and San Francisco, and you compare it to the 10 least walkable, Tampa, Orlando, or 29 and 30, Phoenix, um, that you compare it to the education of the workforce, that the six highest ranked metros, 39% of you have your college degree if you're over 25 years of age. The lowest 10, it's 29%. So obviously this is the knowledge economy, this is where we are, and highly educated people are the ones driving the knowledge economy. Now what does that mean to your wealth? The six highest ranked metros have a GDP per capita of $69,000 compared to the lowest rank of $49,000. It's a 41% premium if you live in Boston over Phoenix. What does that mean? That's the difference between the GDP of Germany versus Greece. And, you know, it doesn't take too much to realize where you would rather be if you were in Europe. So this is a very significant thing to be the wealth 
of your region. To it, that we know that walkable urbanism attracts highly educated people and which drives the GDP per capita. Any questions on that before we go into place management? And after that, we're going to start talking about strategy cards and putting you to work. State capital. Boston's a state capital. Yes. Boston's, Boston's a state capital and the biggest city. Yeah, which yes. also means that it is one of the smallest city portions of its metro area. Yes, it is. And that says a great deal about why Somerville, if Somerville were in, if, if Somerville were a suburb of Chicago, it would be part of Chicago. And there's a reason for that. Because it is a state capital, <laughs> the legislature didn't want to be run by the mayor of Boston. And they, they limited the, shot, the, the, the growth of the city long ago. Actually, and one of the reasons that we also saw it was racism. That... Um, Curlyism was a bigger deal. Yeah, and you know, right. we, we certainly saw that in, in Washington. Oh, yeah. Racism. That um, Washington, the city, is 11% of the metro. You're 14% of the metro. That's actually reasonably typical that since we hate our cities in the late 20th century, we didn't let them expand. We ghettoized them and got out of Dodge as quickly as possible. There's a, um, a um, friend of mine does cartoons for the Post and about land use. And it's about the racial view of how we've been um, building our cities. And it's a couple panels. And the first panel is a white family out in the suburbs saying, Wow, this is great. We got away from them. And a couple panels later is a black family out in the suburbs saying, Oh, I see why Whitey liked this so much. This is great. Final panel is the white family back in the city saying, Well, that worked. Um, <laughs> race has always been the underlying driver in how we built our cities. And it's about time to get over it. Um, so, yeah. Yes. in the meeting also from work, but um, you seem extremely knowledgeable about how cities are run and statistics. I just found it weird that what seemed most important to me for progressive development of a city was getting into that upper right hand corner of the graph and like your knowledge just dropped. Is there no <laughs> clue other than just pointing to these people who may not know what to do about that? Do you have any statistics for that? Funny you should ask. Um, I don't have all the answers out by far. This is still worth learning, but I'll show you after this 14 things that could be done to be part of your, of your social equity affordable housing strategy. And by the way, the number one thing, make auxiliary housing units legal. And I assume you have done that. But if you haven't, do it. There are, by my guess, 150 million surplus bedrooms in this country that if we just change the law and change a little design to have separate entrances, we'd have a whole raft of affordable housing just by all the spare bedrooms that we cannot legally rent out. I was just saying, besides Airbnb, the problem is that we don't have the huge range of single family housing in Somerville. So most of our housing is auxiliary units. Just, uh, Chris, can you also, there may be people in the room who do not understand what auxiliary units are. Um, so auxiliary housing units, have you ever watched HGTV and, uh, and the show Income Property? And what they do is, that, and this is up in Canada where it is legal, where it's a much more progressive country, and that, you, that they go in and they rehab somebody's basement, and it's generally a young couple, that big mortgage and struggling, and they rehab the basement, and they rent it out to a carpenter or to the school teacher. And they get rent, it's 
it's an affordable place and they get rent to help them with a mortgage. This was done to my house in 1949. Yes, exactly. And um, that's how we have two apartments, now one, but two apartments in our house. So most of Somerville has done that. So, so. But we'll talk about affordable housing if the group wants to. Yes. Um, I might have missed this, but I'm just trying to understand that basically the, the walkable urban areas attract the um, highly educated people who have higher wage earning potential and then in the, the statistic about the percent that they're spending on housing and transportation it's higher in walkable it's lower in walkable urban areas but they would be earning a higher income right. so but just if you can explain what what does this mean for for low income like how does where would low income people fit into this model do they want to you know where should they be or how could we ideally they would be um, that the lower income people would be spending less on transportation. The average walkable urban household spends 9% of their household income on transportation compared to 25% for drivable suburban. So they would not be a slave to their car payments. But, but, so but that's number one. But housing is still so much more so. Housing, that's the it, challenge. Not just as a percentage of income, but. And I'm just yeah. giving the challenge to you that how to craft an affordable housing strategy, an attainable housing strategy. Um, and one thing that you've already agreed to do as a city is to have 20% set aside for affordable housing, which can all subsidize stuff. So that's one thing you've already done. What more do you want to do? It takes, generally, it takes a subsidy. The question is, where is the money coming from? And we just saw in the fiscal impact model, you happen to have on average, $10 million per year. So here's a decision for you. Where's that money going to be spent? And by the way, Arlington is another model still. Go, you know, we, we can give you more. Arlington, year in, year out, drops $7 million into their affordable housing program. And they have all sorts of uh, really aggressive zoning to, to, to demand a high percentage going into affordable housing. So, you know, it's, it's not just, and by the way, that seven million is coming out of the pockets of Arlington taxpayers. So it's not just, you know, don't expect to just push it off to somebody else. This is up to you all, personally, Virginia. doing this. That's in uh, Virginia, Arlington, Virginia. But the other 20% affordable house is not affordable. <laughs> okay, that's, so. We need to define what's affordable. So this is your job. I'm going to turn it back on you. So how, how do we subsidize the, the, the cost difference between market rate housing and affordable housing? And there's a gap. It's got to be subsidized. And you're going to make decisions using the fiscal impact model to figure out how you subsidize that and how much you do. And it means you can do less parks or something else. And that's part of the trade-off. Yes. Um, when you say we uh, the export job jobs is uh, or they attract this model attract uh, high quality um, people. So my concern is if we are looking to keep local jobs for local people, how we want to be prepared for those who are not ready for those jobs. So that can be part of the uh, community benefit or how we... The, the issue here is job training. And that is also something part of the strategy cards of, of do you want to engage as part of your community benefits? in a more extensive job training focus. I've been involved with a lot of place-based strategies that had that exact challenge. It was downtown Cincinnati that I was working on, and, and they have a fabulous community college system. And the community college president was at the table, and he was saying, damn it, that's exactly what I want to do. What do you need? I will provide the, the training, I'll, and I'll bring it to the uh, downtown Cincinnati make it happen. So that's also something that, you know, if there's a job training gap, which there is in most parts of the world, uh, in most parts of this country, I mean, we now have a lot of jobs. 
5% unemployment and falling, we now have a gap in skills. Frank. <clears throat> One of the things I think that we, we keep seeing is like we keep seeing a very black and white, you know, we keep seeing, you know, we talk about affordable and we're talking about the, you know, the, that percentage of the, of the uh, uh, population that needs the affordable and then we, mm -hmm. we focus on the market and the people that can't afford it. Um, and one of the projects that I've been working on in Cambridge, um, and it's actually my project is the first time that they've done it, which I thought was very interesting, is that they've created for their affordable component. They don't call it. They don't want to call it affordable either. What they want to call it is inclusionary housing, and they're dividing it into a series of percentages of brackets of um, AI. AI, income. because AI is is the average median income in the region. So. You can have 80 percent AMI, which what would that be? 45,000? No, 60,000 is 80 percent. So 60,000 median income is 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 80 percent of the average in the region. You have 40 percent affordable housing. You have 20 percent of the so of one of the AMI. So one of the concerns in why Cambridge was doing that is as they were seeing a lot of this development, which they thought that. Um, and we became the guinea pigs for it, but we think that in the end it's become a very successful uh, product, is that they, they have a tier as well, what they refer to as middle income, in which they put in the bracket between 90, uh, and it can be up to 120 okay. AMI. Workforce housing. Which really, it's workforce housing, which is one of the things that we continue discussing at ULI yes. about what this is, and I think that there's a lack of... Hans uh, Williger is... Correct, and there's a lack of, I think, of understanding uh, and a lot of components what, to that, what that really is, and I think that that's the opportunity that we can have as well here in which we can target something like that because what you're targeting when you deal with that is you, you, you deal with the teachers, the cops, the fire department people, and those are the people that you want to maintain and you're capable of doing that. And this product that we just finished in Cambridge was sold, another developer bought it, and understanding what they still had to comply with and what they were getting a certain percentage of uh, market only and it seemed to be a deal that they were capable so it seems to me that maybe perhaps we're not, we shouldn't be looking at it as just 20% affordable and what is that, you know, but more of like creating a tier component. That's very fair. Everybody yes. feels that they're contributing something and giving something up because it's got to be a give and take to a certain extent. Right. No, and, and it's a matter of crafting as much across the entire spectrum as possible in, in the place. It may not be mixed income every project. It might be a completely affordable housing project right next door to a market rate project. And um, the best model, by the way, that I've seen, and this is the best we've seen in the country, is called the Pearl District in Portland, Oregon. They put a streetcar in back in 2000. And what the city said is, we'll put in the streetcar, but we want the Pearl District, which was an obsolete industrial zone. There was almost no displacement. There was a bunch of empty warehouses and factories. And we want this, the Pearl, to look like the city as a whole, as far as its demographics. And through place management, they created, uh, I think it's 32%. I mean, this is all new housing. None of it's old stuff. All new housing. I think 32% of it is affordable housing of one sort or another. I've never seen anything done higher in the country. So that's the best we've seen in the country. And it took a lot of effort, but, it, but it's doable. And um, the only other thing they, they all had to watch was the TV show Portlandia. So, um, so let's move on because we have still some more to cover and I'm sure you want to go to sleep at some point. Yes, Joe. About the about giving equity in Cincinnati, they give equity to people to, to people with Section Eight if they volunteer and go, come to meetings like this and and help maintain the building. Equity is a very substantial it's goodie. A very important thing. Um, I don't know about that program. What I did engage in at UC Irvine, I mentioned it earlier, that UC Irvine was losing 50% of the job offers they made for faculty and staff because of the high cost of housing. They had land though. Land's key. 
70% of the affordable housing crisis is land costs. 70%. So they had the land. And we set up a nonprofit development corporation that ended up building 1,000 housing units, almost all for sale. And we could get people in at less than 50% of market. That the land was leased to them at a dollar per year, but it had a resale control. So nobody would get, you know, there'd be no, no windfall profit. But still, if the market went up 10% over the time that they owned it, their equity went up 10%. Or, you know, and, and so they could build equity, but it would still be affordable for the next faculty member. They would also get the tax, the tax, exactly. tax, they get the tax ownership. Exactly. Most people don't know that. Right. Yes. So there's lots of things you can do. There's, I mean, there's a lot of, there's phenomenal. I mean, you've got with, I mean, your CDC here. Some, I mean, this is one of the best CDCs I know in the country, literally. And um, now, I hate to say it, the bar's kind of low, but you're really good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But, but there's a lot of great models out there. Mercy and um, you know, Don Turner's organization, out Bridge, out in California. I mean, some fabulous programs. Chattanooga Neighborhood Enterprises, a friend of mine, started that. 500 homes per year. Most of those homes in Chattanooga were in existing neighborhoods. They had, except for one person, they had zero displacement. They renovated all these homes that were slums. The one person that was displaced was deemed mentally incompetent. All the rest, 500 per year. You can do it. So we have to talk about placement. Chris, are you implying that somebody who's mentally ill is, like you said this twice, the, when you came to present at the CAC, you gave the same anecdote, and it just gets under my skin, the idea that, well, this one guy was displa displaced, but he was crazy, so like, whatever, it doesn't matter. I just want to push back on it. I'm sure there were other people that stayed in their houses. Gotcha. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not, sir. You had a good talk with that. Um, the um, place management, why this is important, is because it's a missing level of governance in our society that, that we We've been dealing with three levels of government <coughs> since 1790, when the country had four million people and you in Massachusetts had 380,000 people. It's time to recognize that we're much, much bigger and we're much, much more complex. We also know that these walk-ups need a much higher level of services than local government can provide. That the competition is tough. You're competing against Harvard Square. You're competing against Back Bay. You're competing against the Seaport. And you're going to have to be competitive and offer services and cleanliness and safety and festivals. And all the stuff that you want, I'm guessing, because you want this to be authentically you. But it costs more money than the city of Somerville can afford to, to focus on this 400 acre part of your city. It should be consciously mixed income, as, I've, as, as we've been talking. And to get there, I believe it must be consciously managed. It's not going to happen unconsciously. The market's not going to do it. And as, I've, as we've been talking, that these places are the number one way we're going to address climate change. So three levels of, of government that we've had for 200 years, 225 years. And we have these miss, missing levels of government, of governance. They don't have to, have to be government, but at the metropolitan level, we have to get our act together. Europe does it, China does it, we don't. But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about place management. Below city government, a level of governance that delivers the services necessary to provide the social equity, to provide the increased quality that these places are demanding and for you to be competitive. And so it's a three-legged stool. The public sector has a major role to play. As I say, the private sector is investing the bulk of the money. It's, it's 
10, 15 dollars for every one dollar public. But place management is absolutely key to make this happen. And we now have lots of examples throughout the country. One of the things that we've seen is that these place management, that they grow over time. Over the last 20 years, we've seen them, they always start in, over towards the left-hand side as a cost center where they, um, they have a, a series of services that they offer and they get a budget. And they, and they spend that budget to make it clean and safe. Generally, clean and safe is where you start. Increase the cleanliness, and you make it a little safer. You're connected to the police, all that good stuff. Then you move it into more of a profit center, where you're running festivals, like what you're doing right now. I mean, with the uh, with, with the fluff fest. And but you move into things like managing parking. Parking is so badly managed in this country. Probably most, I would guess, even center city Boston, the parking spaces are probably 50% utilized. 50% are empty at any given time of the day or night. And, but, but managing parks and managing Wi-Fi, and managing all sorts of things that need to be managed to make it a better place. And then eventually you get into an investment center where the place manager starts borrowing serious money and putting in local transit, streetcars, um, building, um, you know, uh, rebuilding the sidewalks and putting in better street furniture and expecting a return on that investment. So you're gonna see that, that this is ramping up throughout the country as far as the intensity of this management and you've gotta get with it to compete. That's part of the the job of the strategy. And here's one of the best examples, and, and it may not be best as far as you're concerned, because it's a big city, it's New York. But it was such a remarkable turnaround. This is Bryant Park at 42nd Street and Avenue of the Americas. Also in Bryant Park is the New York Public Library, the iconic public library with the two lions uh, on the stairs. The public library was gonna leave they needed more space, and the five-acre Bryant Park was a city park. They had a budget of $250,000 per year to manage the park for the city parks department. And for that, they got the moniker of Needle Park. It was the best drug dealing center in Midtown Manhattan. So, so the public library wanted to leave. All the, all the buildings around it turned their backs on it, and it was a pretty dismal place. A business improvement district was formed, one of the place management organization types. There's many of types, like, like Main Street. But a business improvement district was formed. They privately redeveloped the entire park, no public money. They told the city to keep your sneaking $250,000. And they raised all the operating costs privately. 85% of it is now coming from the park itself. Its annual budget is $12 million. And they have restaurants and kiosks. It is, it is by far the best park in this country. As a result, the entire lower Midtown is now incredibly popular. And the New York Times just put their building up two blocks west of this. Bank of America just put up a building right, right catty corner to it. Um, this, you can go there day and night, and this place is just a fabulous place to visit. Very safe. They have all these little um, uh, Parisian uh, cafe stools or uh, seats. They have, they, they have a thousand of them. You can move them any place you want. Nobody tells you what to do, and they lose one a month. They came to realize that if you treat people in a civilized fashion, 99.9% .9 of us will act in a civilized fashion. And um, they, they have a public bathroom here. Can you imagine a public bathroom? <laughs> they have a public bathroom that when you walk in the lobby of it, there are flowers, fresh flowers, every day. And it's, it has attendance, and people treat it in a very, very lovely, civilized manner. And this is on 42nd Street in New York. Yes? In, in addition to this being an inspiring example of placement, 
some of the goals that we've been talking about, which is to say the value of the open space to the surrounding real estate. Yes, absolutely. And open uh, space generates value in the surrounding area. You, you know, this is your classic lungs of the city. Say that again. Lungs of the city. Lungs of the city. <laughs> Open space generates real estate value. We in real estate know that. So, we actually know that. But it must be managed. It cannot just sort of meander along and become what Bryant Park was. So I'm going to suggest some goals. You can modify them at will. But one is, is that it should be authentically Union Square and Somerville. It should, again, this should reflect who you are as a people. That people don't want to come here to visit or to move here or to um, work here if you have some Disneyland kind of artificial environment. Um, you should be focusing on all of Union Square. This isn't just one little piece, you know. Look holistically at the entire 400 acres. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as we've been talking all day, that the community benefits are paid by the economic success of the entire entity. And I would urge you to have one set of community benefit that is then that all developers that come in, they know it's completely predictable and you're not driving people away, having to cut side deals left and right. People want predictability. Have one set and then you know, cut the deal, you know, the same deal with every with every developer that comes in. I would, I mean, personally, I would urge you to to and talking about this all afternoon is it should be measured on the triple bottom line, the economic benefits, um, and obviously that includes the fiscal impact, the social equity and the measurement system that we've developed you might want to use or you might come up with your own and environmentally sustainable we don't have a place-based environmental metric lead nd isn't very good um, so we don't have that but we do have metrics of the of the economic and of the social social equity and again we might be looking at a different social social one which would include the uh, the gini coefficient the gini coefficient is the most used metric of income inequality. It measures the highest versus the lowest uh, 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 income households. So those are some thoughts for, for you. And the next thing we want to talk about is the strategy cards and the work you're going to do over the next couple months. But any questions on what we just went through? Yeah. So um, often we talk about individual income inequality, and there is a huge growing regional municipal income inequality. Huge. And, and that affects, I mean, Somerville's median income, so we're in the middle, but the, the, the divergence of municipal income in Massachusetts is staggering. And so I'm wondering if there are things like the Gini coefficient that, that can be applied to that. And I, I mean, I guess this is just context. It's not Union Square because it's a little bigger, but um, it, it is a massive failure of regional planning to have this municipal separation of wealth. Actually, that issue is a topic I had a cover story in the Atlantic on about uh, six years ago. It, the, um, the title was The Next Slum. And the next slum, and this is turning out to be true, are the drivable suburban communities on the fringe of our metropolitan region. Those are the ones that their tax base is a monoculture. It's almost all residential. And those residential values are plummeting. And meanwhile, concentration of poverty, people living out there have to have a fleet of cars to to earn a living, and so they're just driving themselves down this, this downward spiral. Meanwhile, when you concentrate poverty, 
And that's where the social indicators all go haywire. To me, that's the definition of an evolving slum. So there, I mean, but you're in, I would suggest, you're in a far better position. And you, know, you Somerville, you know, again, look at Arlington and see, you know, you're firing on all cylinders. No, no, we're, we're in a good situation compared to, and, and we want to stay median income, right? We don't want to, um, I think, change that dynamic. But for example, uh, three decades ago, Cambridge had 25% average income than Somerville, now it's 75. Three decades ago, Winchester had 50% higher average income than Lawrence, now it's 200%. There, there's just a massive spread going on that is going to come back and, and really hit all of us in the face. I, I've been doing some work over the last few years out in, out in Springfield. It, it ain't pretty. And besides the heroin and the fact that it's on the drug alley, it's, it's got serious, serious challenges. Eric, did you have know? Yes, there are, and it'll go up. Uh, you had mentioned uh, business development districts as an example of one of these sorts of organizations or a structure that can Community be development used. districts, yes. Um, can you provide us with both some examples and also what are some of the key attributes that will make an organization able to act effectively in that kind of role? Yes, 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 yes. And now, community benefit districts is a relatively new concept. It has to be enabled by the state legislature, though your good mayor said he'll do it on his own. I don't know whether he can actually pull that off, but <laughs> and make sure that happens, please. Um, but um, uh, there's a group here in Massachusetts working on at the state house to get these approved. Generally, place management organizations are funded by the private sector. So it's an issue of getting the, the private landowners and property owners to voluntarily tax themselves pay for this stuff. That's how Bryant Park was paid for, and that's how almost in all of these, I mean, that's how the Main Street is paid for. Um, uh, you may get some money from the city, but generally it's from, the, I assume it's zero. Okay, so, oh, so you do get some, right. Um, every, I've been involved primarily with business improvement districts, and it's all private money, and in fact, um, we sort of followed what they did in Bryant Park, and we, in, in the business improvement districts I was involved with when I got involved, they were getting a token amount of money from the city. It was more trouble to go to city council and kiss rings and, 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 and ask for, you know, for the $50,000 or something. We just said, we'll just raise it ourselves. And um, so uh, it's, it tends to be privately funded, though. So whatever you're proposing, whatever this group proposes, you've got to get the private property owners to voluntarily tax themselves to fund this. And the minimum budget that I found works is about a million bucks that you've got to raise. What's your budget right now at the Main Street, Esther? So about 100,000 for Main Street. So it's 10 times what you have in Main Street. That's minimum. Scott. You know, um, another way to fund a place-making organization and sustain it actually is through the DIF financing. So, in other words, you can, you know, some of the revenues or that you raise from the bonds that you issue. That's good. Um, that's true. And that's probably a more direct uh, way. You know, it might be something if, that if indeed we went with a DIF. And the other thing that I th would strongly recommend about a DIF is that you can prescribe a very large area. It's often not the case. Unfortunately, diffs can be abused and it's just for like to redo a mall or something like that. But you can prescribe the entire neighborhoods and say, here's where we anticipate the growth. And from that, we'll get a lot of revenues. And that helps you then take some of those revenues and put them over and run your arts organizations or do your mixed, in, mixed yep. income housing, yep. et cetera. Chris. Any ways to skin a cat. And that's well, much, that's well within our, our actual means to do without major legislation. Chris? Yes. Sorry. Just, again, be mindful that not everyone understands what these acronyms are. So I, for anyone who might not know what DIF is, is a district improvement financing, and it is a tool that um, needs this, I believe, city and 
state approval in order to enact it, but allows you to capture the value added as a result of the new development projects that can be directly rerouted back into the, any net benefit can be rerouted back into that district. So we've done one in Assembly Square, and we've talked about doing one in Union Square. So just as these conversations continue, for if, if there are things like DIF or other acronyms that come up that you don't necessarily know what they are, just let us know. Can I just add briefly, the reason why I raise it is because while I think once you get an example like Bryant Park humming, yes, you can do assessments on local businesses, but this is a startup method to really see a full-blown sustainable that's organization. That's probably the best use of it. That, that, and it is still coming from, quote unquote, the private market, because it's the new value that the private developers are going to create, and they're going to capture later, you know, and so forth. So it's just a more direct, clearer way to get jump-started as opposed to legislation and so forth which is, you know, a crapshoot in this state. Hi, so I have three thoughts that have come up over the last discussion. The first, just there's a lot of talk about um, junkies and needles, and actually Somerville has a very serious uh, problem currently with substance abuse that I think probably a lot of us know about. I think it's a serious issue that we should be figuring out how to deal with and how to provide resources and support to people who are struggling with addiction, not marginalize them or move them out um, so that we can create value in these districts. Um, the other thing uh, that I was curious about, based on the last discussion, it seems like, maybe this was mentioned earlier and I missed it, but it seems like this whole process is premised on the fact that there will be a place management organization, and I was wondering if the strategy leaders have actually had the opportunity to discuss that and decide whether that's something that we want, um, and whether this really is a missing level of governance, or whether it is, um, or whether it is not. Um, and I just also wanted to clarify: you're talking about the private sector um, funding um, a place management organization, and it's true that businesses are the private sector, but uh, I think we also need to be talking about how developers, as larger entities that are going to be making a lot of profit in Union Square, that's the private sector that's gaining the most profit out of development. That's the private sector, not a lot, a lot of the smaller businesses that Esther's working with through Main Streets shouldn't necessarily be the ones funding the future of Union Square. So let me see if, obviously, if you've got a serious drug problem here, that's a so just a horrible thing to, to see happen. And again, Springfield is just decimated by it. Um, so one of the things that the, the same fellow who did the Bryant Park Business Improvement District did the Grand Central Terminal Business Improvement District, and one of the big, they, they did a, a survey of the homeless around Grand Central when they first started, and they had 396 and they had a very aggressive homeless, with, which was a housing first strategy. And about five years later, they had six. And the rest, they hadn't been moved out. They'd been put into homes. And uh, the manager knew all six of them by first names. Uh, so this is, this is one of the reasons place management, I'm suggesting, is something that you should consider. But you don't have to. So absolutely. Don't necessarily, I mean, if you, you know, you don't have to do that. And, you know, and the Main Street, as, as, you know, as it's currently working, might just be fine. Thank you very much. Um, the issue is who's going to, um, you know, implement the strategy. And now, in Europe, it tends to be a public sector that, that manages place management. In Paris, it's, it's the city. They don't have business improvement districts. So it might be some, you know, that's a model that's, that's been around a long time. So it's absolutely up to you, as I say. I don't live here. This is your challenge to figure it out. Um, and as far as the private sector, um, there's also, you know, we could have a whole conversation, I've got it loaded on the machine, about value sharing as a concept. And it's been very effectively used on new developments. And there's a 
whole different way of, of doing it. There's lots of different ways of, of doing it to consider. Just keep in mind, you're competing against, again, Kendall, Harvard, and other places. And if you don't get that new investment dollar in, none of these you know, $10 million per year um, uh, fiscal impact benefits are going to be there. So you're not competing in a vacuum. Yes? Hi, uh, my name is Rudy Margolis. I'm, I'm a member of the Union United. I was just doing uh, like a short research on the Bryant Park because I'm interested, you know, like to see um, what is the model there. And um, on a couple of articles, I send it out uh, to our members. But um, it seems like uh, uh, this model basically gentrified the neighborhood and um, uh, displaced a lot of artists and people who. Uh, try to build community. So I think the question is for this group, is that the model that you want to use in Union Square? Some, something that is, you know, displacing the community, is displacing um, low-income folks. Um, so I think, you know, like they're here, uh, we're exploring certain models that might not be the right ones for Union, Union Square. And I think that is the question that you need to answer uh, later on. Um, nobody lived in Bryant Park. Um, it's, it's a public park and the people, most of the people who were quote displaced didn't live around it either and it's now a park which is widely used. It is also used for very high end things like Fashion Week and so there is clearly actually, an argument that actually, it's not they anymore. <laughs> they got rid of them because it was too crowded with Fashion Week. It yeah. was a million dollar per year income and they said go someplace else. So it's really, be, it, it, it has been returned to the public because it was unsafe for anybody um, except people who were, you know, uh, and, and it, it, it's a design, it's an interesting design example. But I think that, you know, to, to understand what you're saying, Chris, and that it seems that the placemaking, um, or the, what, what do you call it? Place management. Place management system is simply uh, an, an, a layer inserted that would accept the revenues and manage the various programs that one would as a community decide were wanted and that would mean that you didn't have a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, one -one agreement with developers but that all developers coming from anywhere would know what they were quote buying into as a set of relationships, it may or may not be the thing we want, but it, but am I understanding that right? That that's why you think that it's one, valuable. That is definitely one option. Is that the place manager, um, whether it be Main Street, Union United, somebody new, a uh, new community benefit district, that, that that they are designated as the place manager, and they they then engage in the community benefit agreement with all new developers, and again. Personally, ideally, it'd be best if it'd be a uniform deal with everybody, so it's not a, a constant horse trading, and there's great predictability. But that, that's one model. And, and what is the next step with us? Is, you want to go home. <laughs> yes, the last thing is to go through the cards. So um, there's a couple more comments. So Chris, Chris. We have to wrap, we say. Well, one more comment. Hi, thank you. Um, I think the example of Bryant Park is an interesting one, but uh, I think a distinction needs to be made between open space and public space. Uh, if you look at Zuccotti Park, another park in New York City that's privately managed, that was the, the epicenter of Occupy Wall Street, which is very much about people asserting their right to the city, asserting their right to occupy space within the city, and they were um, legally allowed to be displaced from that park because it was privately managed, it was essentially privately owned. So I don't think it's without consequence, and I think these are the subtexts that we need to be looking at. Uh, in terms of kind of a, a better model of place management, and not exactly what's being discussed here, uh, is the community land trust model, where the community, yeah, so where the community actually owns the land, so I've been involved with the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in uh, Roxbury in Boston, 
Um, and so they're able to uh, direct what goes on the land through uh, direct um, resident engagement. Uh, I'm not quite sure about the financing and all that, but it is another model to consider. That's a place management organization at the local level, at, at a local serving place. The most successful place managers so far have been regionally significant because they can get to scale, because they got a larger tax base. But Dudley's a great model for a local serving place. And, and, and yes, land trusts are fabulous, particularly, you know, they can be good for parks, but they even better for affordable housing. Because again, 70% of the reason we have an affordable housing crisis is because we don't have, you know, that land prices are so high. And the mad thing about it is, again, you're only using 5.6% of your land for walkable urban land, and the, and the, the values of that 5.6% are through the roof. You know, make it 8%, make it 10%, and those land values will start dropping. But but land trusts are a great way. They're just fabulous. A good friend of mine is, who's now a congressman, was you know, sort of the torchbearer for land trusts over the years. One of the illusions that you've made in some of this discussion is the fact that Somerville has like four or five other zones like Union Square that aren't going to pop up as fast because ours is further along towards the green line exploitation. But, and they may, not, they may not pop up as big by any means, but they will pop up. Magoon Square is a, another good example. Furthermore, they are replicants, as are we in many ways, of David Square. So that the irony is that what you're talking about is a, is a program we already have as a model. We can look and, and, and adapt. Part of my concern, the land trust model is absolutely critical. And the Lincoln Land Institute has a tremendous library of this stuff. Who runs the, I mean, he, yeah. Lincoln Land is within walking distance. And Lincoln the Land, best the other feature about Lincoln Land. Thinking about land use. They also have, have one of the best libraries on, 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 on transfer taxes. Because the easiest way you support a. a you like trust, transfer taxes? <laughs> <laughs> but the easiest way you support a, a trust is with an income. And the easiest way you created that, that kind of an income is a specific targeted tax. That's all. That transfer tax, I just, I just moved two years ago. DC has one, and I just wrote a big check. So, I mean, I know. <laughs> and it went to affordable housing. So, yes? I, I felt the need no. to um, want to reassure the gentleman from Union United that came up right over here. I think he's checking his phone right now. Um, you came up and you, and you mentioned, are we going to go with a model that pushes out artists and makers and low-income people? In looking around this room right now, I can say with a lot of confidence that we're not. Just in, just in some of the people that have been talking. So I, I wanted to make a point to to comment on that. Before I was whatever it is that I am in this city, God only knows what I am right now, but I was the daughter of an electrician and a hairdresser that owned a sub shop in Magoon Square for a couple of years. I'm not anything special. I didn't come from anything special. My parents bought our house in 1981 for $19,000, fire damaged. I still live in that home with my mother and father because I cannot afford to live in the city of Somerville by myself. So I can tell you with all the confidence in my four foot 11 being <laughs> that any sort of model that displaces basically the people that raised me will not get my signature. Thank you. On that topic, I would also suggest, and, and we'll get out to you some of the research that's been done recently on displacement and gentrification. And it's conflicting. In fact, the bulk of it says that gentrifying census districts have less movement, less displacement than non-gentrifying census tracts. So it's, you know, the, the you know, the wisdom of the crowd is that 
gentrification leads to massive displacement. The research is not backing that up yet. Maybe it will. It's complicated. It's, it, it's complicated. And so it's not just a knee-jerk reaction. We'll get you some of that research that, that's out there. You know, the Cleveland Fed just did, uh, did something um, that, again, counterintuitive, kind of like that 43, 48%, you know, where'd that come from? So, um, we need to talk about the strategy cards and let you all go home that, I know this has been so much fun, <laughs> that um, 23 pages of sheer joy. If you don't take a sleeping pill, this will do it for you. As I mentioned earlier, these strategy cards are meant to be a skeleton. It's meant to spark ideas. And if you get angry and throw them out, great. That's what, that's what it's meant to be. In fact, I suspect the very first one there, you'll throw out gleefully. You're not going to be bulldozing and putting in cul de -sacs. But these are part of the options of a, of a regionally significant place. And so they fall into a few categories. One is the character of the place. So walkable, urban, drivable, suburban, those are the options. Then the social values that, that under, I mean, we've been talking most of the afternoon about your social values. And that's why these two cards are here, both what Boston means as a region and what Union Square means as a place. And beginning to define that, because if you can't define your social values and what underlies this, you're going to get lost very quickly. Then we turn to housing, you know, homeless, low income attached, existing low income housing maintenance and improvement. This is the Chattanooga Neighborhood Enterprise Model. And then moving into market rate housing. Then you move into employment and economic development on, on page seven. Yes. I don't have them on the screen. So page seven, economic and employment and economic development. You, you remember I, I talked about earlier about the three kinds of jobs. I have two of them here, export employment, and regional employment, not local serving employment, because local serving employment tends to just come along. It's kind of when, you know, I used to live in Santa Fe and in the high desert, and when it rained, wildflowers sprouted. That's kind of the same thing with local serving. If, if we were in Russia, where I used to do real estate development in, in St. Petersburg, um, local serving was something that you would have to focus on because they were all communists and they didn't know how to do local serving, you know, they, 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 they lost the ability. They very quickly regained it, but uh, early in the, you know, back in the 90s, they weren't exactly oriented towards building companies and new businesses that were local serving retail. Is the local serving would that be restaurants and like other very small businesses? Um, it depends on, most restaurants are regionally significant, not all. Some are local serving, so they, so they divide into two types. Just as some teachers teach at an elementary school and teachers teach at the university, the universities regionally, in fact, export, generally speaking. Some are regional, like community college, and, and, and a school teacher is local. So restaurants can be even, they can actually be export, where people are coming from throughout the the country to come to. It. So local is where would be? Dry cleaners are definitely local. Within a few square miles. It, it just depends where your customers come from. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's the drawing radius of your customer. That if you can rely upon walking distance for your dry cleaner, my dry cleaners with walking distance, I would, you know, there's only a few blocks I'm going to go with a load of laundry. So um, um, that's local service. Again, if, if you want to add a new one. But yeah. don't local services also contribute to the walkability of, yes. the, of yes. the, the community? And maybe what we need to do is add a local serving card 
and please. Oh, we we will. Okay. <laughs> I love it. That's great.